Good morning. It's 9.06. I'm Anne Wendel from the VDMA Machine Vision, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Industrial Vision Days 2024. Overall, we have over 70 presentations, exciting sessions about um, 3D imaging technologies, machine vision applications, uh, smart cameras, embedded vision, lighting systems, beyond the visible, hyperspectral camera technology. Here it is high-speed camera that is a very hot topic. Optics and filters, of course, imaging standards, and machine vision software and AI. I hope you enjoy the Industrial Vision Days. Um, here on side of the vision, but also on the screen. So whenever you miss a presentation, everything will be professionally filmed and streamed. It's available on the vision website, um, live and also on demand already the following day. So a big thank you to the technicians and of course to vision, to Messe Stuttgart who supports and sponsors the Industrial Vision Days. Okay, so I just come from the VDMA Machine Vision presentation at the Vision Press Conference, where we published new figures. Um, unfortunately, we are all aware of it, um, we have quite challenging times, not only in Europe, but all over the world. So the VDMA Machine Vision forecast for the European machine vision industry and for the German machine vision industry is minus 10% for 2024. However, maybe with the vision, the three days of talks, of discussion, maybe the turnaround will happen earlier. That would be great. Um, yeah, that's it from my side. Um, I just say enjoy, welcome, and whenever you have questions, please feel free to contact me or to find VDMA, so our booth is over there, and of course, we will be here on stage, moderating, but also around in the halls. So we have two more minutes to fill before the pr first presentation comes. So therefore, let me give a warm welcome to Pan Jin. Pan Jin from CMVU, the Chinese Machine Vision Union, the association from China. Um, he said, I am allowed to share some insights from the machine vision market in China. So he just told me the machine vision industry in China grew by only 10% in 2023. So congratulations. <laughs> it's still an impressive growth figure and um, it's also exciting to see how machine vision in China has been developing over the last years. Um, Pan Xin is here with a delegation of around 50 companies. 50 companies from China exhibit here. Um, and yeah, also looking beyond China towards Europe for competing here at the world leading trade show for machine vision. So a warm welcome, Pan Xin. And whenever you are interested to learn more about the CMVU statistics, feel free to ask Pan Xin. Also, the A3 colleagues from the United States, Bob is here, and from Chia, it's Watanabe-san. You'll find them here also in Hall 8 at the International Vision Standards booth, and uh, the European Machine Vision Association, EMVA, also is available there. So that's it from my side. Thank you. And I'm now happy to welcome the first speaker. It's Sadiq from Teledyne Fleer, and he is going to talk about reimagining designing cycles, accelerating machine vision. So you said, I'm here 
First speech, thank you for coming and for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak over here. It's always good to be the first speaker uh, at any conference. Uh, and really, we're hoping to see more of you uh, as you come through. Uh, my name is Sadek Panjwani, and I'm general manager for Teledyne Integrated Imaging Solutions Business. Uh, we focus on machine vision area scan technologies, uh, the historical portfolio of point gray research cameras, uh, Teledyne Luminera and Dalsa Genie Nano portfolio are part of uh, uh, some of the cameras that we design and manufacture. Now, Teledyne has a lot of legacy uh, in innovations in machine vision. Uh, and we have uh, been introducing a lot of breakthrough technologies, all the way from sensor to cameras to software to uh, services, uh, in order to advance uh, the machine vision industry. Uh, one of our core uh, objectives in our organization is to take some fearless ambition uh, in order to create technologies and solution to help solve very complex problems uh, that we are witnessing in our industries. Machine vision, as we have seen, has gone through unprecedented challenges and change over the last couple of years. But it is an industry which will continue to see significant growth uh, as we go into the future. And as such, uh, it is very important for us to see things beyond technologies that are going to be impactful uh, in our industry. Uh, both from a technology perspective as well as uh, from, uh, from a business perspective as well. And two things that we see very common in our industry is, despite of the growth, the expertise on machine vision resources uh, is a challenge. We also see that design and cycle, despite of everything that has happened in the industry, continues to be quite long. And the fragmentation of the industry continues to influence. And therefore, I'm pleased to share with you here uh, a concept that we have been working on in order to truly bring a remarkable innovation to the marketplace that will help build a stronger community for machine vision customers, uh, as well as advance our market forward. Now, at the core of machine vision is a sensing technology. And along with the processing engine, uh, we build solutions in order to inspect, to guide, uh, as well as to measure in different kind of applications. And what we are finding that while the technology is quite simple from an implementation, the combination of cameras to lenses um, as well as lightning uh, makes it quite complicated for a machine vision system builder in order to build the technologies together. And the time consuming nature, anytime there is a change in one of these components, makes it very, very challenging. And what it ends up doing uh, in the industry is there are two things that we start commonly seeing. One is the complexity uh, in machine vision that we continue to witness. And the other one is around the cost. Now think from a machine vision design perspective. Whenever you are building a new system, every time you change a component, it is, it is an additional time into the design and process. And typically, a design and cycle goes between, you know, anywhere between 12 months all the way till 36 months. And during that time, new technologies are getting introduced. So machine vision system builder really has to think through how would they take advantage of all of these technologies which are innovating and coming at the same point in time uh, when, uh, when they are already designing the system. Furthermore, as these designs are completed, it has to stand for a product life cycle for beyond 10 years. And what we are finding, a lot of components today, they have a lifespan of much shorter life cycle, whether you're thinking from an SOC perspective, and that it really limits the ability. So a lot of challenges for a machine vision builder. If you also see from a cost perspective, anytime you buy a new component, it is an additional cost to it. It's a capital investment that you continue to do and you hoard many cameras, many lenses, many lights, some of which will never see a design into mass production. In a conventional design and process, uh, it starts from various different kind of steps. Uh, and as we all know, 
that this process goes anywhere between a 12 to 24 month cycle. Every time a change is driven, there is a new cycle that is introduced in this particular mix, which really means that there is very little time for a machine vision system builder uh, to really advance and research and test and think about new possibilities. And therefore, they rely on a lot of expertise that they had from past implementing various kind of projects. Now, we don't have to be that way. And as an industry, there are two different ways that this has been solved. There is one many of our vendors, including Teledyne, has really helped the industry in coming up with a camera selector, and so is available our lens selector, and so our lightning selector, which really enables a system builder in order to select the right product. There is another approach which really focuses around going to a consultant and getting an advantage through their expertise in order to get the machine vision uh, system built. While these both are options that are available in our industry, but what is missing is they are solving the partial needs. If you are building everything by yourself, you need a level of expertise. And no matter how great your teams is, how, 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 how much the bandwidth they have, they will always be limited in the knowledge that they have, either on the sensors, on cameras, on lightning, uh, on lenses that they have. So you're limited with the knowledge that uh, teams have. And we have been thinking about that if we really want to transform this area, how are we going to do this? Now, in our industry and outside of our industry, there is a big promise, which is coming from Digital Twin. It has been very heavily adopted in the industrial sector. And while in Digital Twin is a, promise, a promising technology, but when we really are starting to think from a Digital Twin perspective, because we have so many components, and each of these components come with its own pathways, to simulate them becomes quite challenging. And therefore, some of the organizations who are using this concept around Digital Twin start with a consulting engagement. They try to understand the scope of the project, they go through consulting, and they really help uh, drive the clarity on what customer wants to achieve. Now, from a conventional perspective, to digital twin through a consulting is a way advancement. And it is a huge big promise that will allow to design machine vision system and really help from a complexity and cost standpoint. While it is very promising, it is also limiting to the knowledge around the consulting as well. Now, by show of hands, tell us if you believe that if we are reducing the design and cycle and if you're reducing complexity in machine vision uh, system buildup, it's of value. And as I look around the room, I see nods around that. But what if I were to tell you that there are even better ways than doing this? And this was a huge big focus for Teledyne. Because what we really wanted to do was to bring a concierge service, a mini Teledyne, to all of you guys, to have that expertise on your fingertip. So imagine, uh, imagine a world in which you are quite capable of implementing uh, this thing, and I'll show it to you. So I'm pleased to announce SiteBase launch here as part of uh, Vision Stuttgart. I invite you all to join us to our booth uh, in order to see a real demonstration of this particular technology. And it has a power of giving you the ability to design a system from your phone 
all the way to your iPad, all the way to your computer. Uh, thanks for joining us today. OK, thank you very much. A warm welcome also from my side. My name is Paul. I'm from Spectronet and Fraunhofer in Jena. And I'm the host of the next session, uh, which is about camera technologies. This is maybe some important device. Oh. <laughs> OK. And um, so a warm welcome from my side. It's good to have you here. And also a warm welcome for all the people who are sitting at home or at work and are on screen and visit visiting the presentations. We will start with the first presentation of the sessions. And our first speaker will be Kaspar van Elpt, CEO, and here as a representative of Dahang Imaging. So, Kaspar, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kaspar van Elpt, and I'm the CEO of Get Cameras. We are the exclusive distributor of Dahang Imaging. And I need something to go to the next sheet. Maybe someone can help me to go to the next sheet. The yeah. OK, then I'm just going to tell a little bit more about the GET cameras. We sell industrial cameras, so machine vision cameras with all kind of interfaces. No worries, no worries. Um, and you can find those at the booth of uh, Dahang Imaging. It's just down that aisle. Uh, our head office is located in the Netherlands. And we also have a location in Germany. France, UK, and the USA. And today I'm going to talk about uh, visible light cameras, polarizing cameras, ultraviolet cameras, short wave infrared cameras, multispectral and even hyperspectral. And then we get a short summary of it. Uh, we're going to mainly discuss a little bit about the te technical part, but it's only also a lot about the applications, how you can use them. So what is visible light? Visible light is actually the light we capture by the naked eye. And cameras, you have monochrome co cameras and color cameras, like everybody can find them in the phone these days. They are very uh, widely used, and they're also very cheap. I'm not going to talk too much about this technology because probably everybody knows about it. Uh, how are they used? What are the applications for that? One of the main applications on this show is machine vision. So for example, for inspecting pills that are in a blister, it's the correct pill inside, and it has every blister also the pills. You can also use them for quality control. So for example, fruit sorting, fruit grading, you can use them in robotics. So detecting the position of a product, uh, reading barcodes, uh, controlling the position of the robot to grab a product. You can use it for sport analytics. So to track the swing of a golfer, but also for the high speed recording, because if you hit the ball, the ball goes with a high speed to the screen, and you need to track the rotation of the ball to calculate how the ball will fly in a digital world. And there are many, many other applications for uh, normal 2D cameras in the visible range. A special version of these cameras is called the polarizing camera. And a light, so now we go a little bit technical. So a light beam is actually a wavelength that goes in all kinds of directions. In this image, you see a horizontal and a vertical wavelength. And by putting a polarizer filter in front of it, only one wavelength will go to the camera sensor. So this is the typical thing that happens when you put a polarizing filter in front of the camera. But there are also special sensors available. And they have on every pixel, they have a polariza polarization filter. But that polarization filter is in a different angle. And by doing that, we can get uh, much more uh, possibilities. So first, we're going to talk about the standard uh, polarization filter. 
and uh, that's mainly used to remove reflections from your image. But you can also make scratches better visible. Uh, the price of such a camera is approximately 1,000 euros. And uh, now we're going to show you some pictures um, where they can use it. So for example, like I said, you have the glass inspection. The top left image is made with a normal camera. But the bottom left image is actually made with a polarization camera. And now you can really see the fingerprints. Um, on the right hand side is a nice application for the police. So when you want to see if somebody is uh, keeping his phone in his hand, then you can use a very good polarization camera for it because you can look through the window shield and you can really see the persons inside the car. So this is how typical uh, polarization cameras are used. We just discussed the visible part, but there is also a part that we don't see with the naked eye. When we go to a lower wavelength, we actually go to the ultraviolet area. So we have ultraviolet A, ultraviolet B, and ultraviolet C. When we go to the higher wavelengths, we actually have the infrared. So infrared, we have near infrared, short wave infrared, mid wave infrared, and long wave infrared. First, we're going to discuss the UV part. After that, we're going to go to the infrared part. Uh, for the UV part, it's actually a monochrome camera, and here you can see the transmission table. And you see that it actually starts at 200 nanometers, uh, while the visible light normally starts around 400 nanometers. What's also interesting to see is that this camera is still sensitive in the visible area. So if you would just use this camera without adding special filters in front of it, it almost works like a normal monochrome camera. So it captures both the ultraviolet and the visible light. And prices of such camera are around 5,000 euros. So what's so special? What can you do with this camera that's not possible with other cameras? And the first thing is, for example, detecting scratches on metal. Uh, another thing you can do is that you can make really high resolution images of small objects. Because you have a very short wavelength, you can better resolve the characteristics of a product. But you can also use it to detect different types of plastic. So on the left hand side, you see four different types of plastic. They are all transparent. Uh, but when you go to the right hand side, you actually see that with a UV camera, they appear differently. So now it's better to sort the different type of plastics. But you can also use it on people to detect the skin condition. Uh, if you want to detect the health of plants, you can check how much UV light they absorb. But also, for example, detecting ESD on power lines. So with a normal camera on the bottom left, you don't see anything, while on the bottom right with a UV camera, you can actually see an ele electronic static discharge happening. So the light spectrum, we just discussed was the UV part. And now we go to the short wave infrared part. Um, Again, uh, it actually starts at the visible light, 400 nanometers, but now it goes all the way up to 1,800 nanometers, while the visible light for a human eye normally goes around 700, 800 nanometers. Uh, these cameras are also monochrome cameras. Uh, they capture the visible light, the near infrared, and the short wave infrared. And they are not using normal sensors. No, they use sensors. And the, these sensors are made from indium gallium arsenide. And uh, that, is, that uh, metal is, uh, makes it possible to convert the uh, uh, light photons into electrons. It's pricing of such cameras around 10,000 euros. But how can you use them? What kind of applications? For example, moisture detection. Uh, fluid detection. So on the top left, you see uh, normal apples. And on the top right, you see uh, the apple with the short wave infrared camera. And you can see, uh, for example, that there uh, is a lot of moisture in the center of the apple. So probably this apple is not as good as the rest of the apples. Actually, this setup we have also running at the booth with a short wave infrared camera. So you can see it yourself. Um, you can detect if a sponge is wet or not wet. 
But you can also distinguish again, like, is it cooking oil or is it normal water that I'm seeing? So also, if you want to see, like, I filled up a bottle and I want with water, and I want to see how full the bottle is, a shortwave infrared camera can give you a lot of contrast. Other applications is uh, granulate. When you inspect granulate, you can see uh, with shortwave infrared suddenly that there is contamination in your granulate. Uh, pastas, you can detect a different type of pastas. But you can also use it for temperature measurement. So around the range of 200 to 300 degrees, you can really clearly see the difference in temperature. The more brighter the, it is, the higher the temperature. So on the left-hand side is the normal camera. Everything just looks white. But on the right-hand side, you can see that the, the solder tip of 240 degree is not as bright as one of 300 degrees. Uh, you can use it for uh, quality inspection. So you can look through a silicon wafer. So on the right-hand side, you actually see what happens when you look through the silicon wafer. You see the rest of the image. But you can also look through plastic packages. So if you want to see if you filled up the pa package, you can actually look through the package to see if your product is inside. That was the UV part. And now we're going to talk about hyperspectral. So what's hyperspectral? It actually means that you make multiple images of one product, but they are all in a very narrow bandwidth. So it can be a combination of UV pictures, uh, a lot of different wavelengths in the visible range, different wavelengths in the short uh, infrared range. And that all combined, we call it actually hyperspectral. So that's what, uh, what's when you have more than 100 different wavelengths. And this is mainly used in research, because in research, you want to see all the wavelengths. And then you're going to define what are the final wavelengths you really need in your application. Um, so here you see, the, again, the complete overview of uh, the different wavelengths. And when you have selected the wavelengths you want to see, then you maybe pick out five or 10 different wavelengths. And then they call it not hyperspectral anymore, but they call it multispectral. Um, and there are two ways to do this. You can have a special camera with a prism in front of it. So the prism breaks up the, the light beam. But you also can use multiple cameras, and they all have a specific filter in front of it. So you can combine a UV camera with a shortwave infrared camera, a color camera, and some monochrome cameras with some bandwidth filters. Uh, and you can use it mainly to detect a different type of material. So uh, this is a lot of uh, technology that's used in plastic sorting and waste sorting machines. So if I summarize it, we have the visible and the near-infrared um, range, and that are the most used cameras. They're very cheap. But sometimes you don't see enough, and you want to see something that you can't see with the naked eye. And then a UV ca camera or a SWIR camera can create a certain contrast, so now you are able to detect it. And then we have the multispectral and hyperspectral. So that means just multiple images from one product in different wavelengths. Thank you for attention. Um, this was uh, Get Cameras. And if there are any questions, please let me know. I'm also available on the booth uh, down there. Are there any questions? OK. Are there any questions? That was a very good, clear presentation then. Of course, <laughs> you did. Thank of you everybody very much. shy, that's also possible. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. OK, ladies and gentlemen, we will go on with the agenda. And our next speaker is Mr. Johannes Eckstein from the Helpling Technik. Company, Technik Company. Help me so, Mr. Eckstein, the stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to my talk with the topic, how well can a low-cost camera's image quality compete with an iPhone 15? And uh, to give you a little bit more feeling about, my, about this topic, um, I want to start with my daily life. So the company Helpling, uh, we are an R&D contractor. We are located in Switzerland with more than 500 
engineers. And in our daily life, we have a wide service portfolio for product innovation, product development, until the industrialization of the products. Uh, most of the 500 engineers there have a background with mechanics, electronics, and software. And uh, there's one team dealing with optics. That is my team. <laughs> so um, we, uh, we are 15 engineers, uh, optical experts, vision experts. And uh, we have two kinds of customers. On the one hand side, customers from the optics industry. And the, on the other hand, we, are, we have customers without any optical knowledge. And uh, for this group of customers, we are an enabler. We enable them to integrate an optical system or vision system into their products. And uh, from these types of customers, sometimes we hear the requirement, we want to have an image quality like an iPhone or uh, like a mobile phone. But on the other hand, as I mentioned, they have no idea about the optics. And I think if you call Apple and you ask them, can I get the camera module from the iPhone, I'm not sure if they agree. So um, yeah. And uh, in addition, we have an optics lab. In the optics lab, we have good measurement possibilities to check the image quality according to the ISO 12233. That's about to measure the image quality of a camera system. And so because of this requirement of the image quality like an iPhone, we decided, OK, let's check the image quality of an uh, of iPhone and of some low-cost cameras. And overall, in the end, it was not only the low-cost and the iPhone, also some industrial cameras. And let's compare them. And a short overview of this comparison is given here in this talk. But to give you a feeling about what we tested, so uh, as a reference, the uh, high-end camera systems we used in Canon's, Canon EOS R6 Mark II. That's a yeah, high-end consumer mirrorless camera. Um, an iPhone X, an iPhone 15 Pro, and a Samsung phone. Then we uh, took some industrial cameras, what we already had in our lab. And then we bought in China some low-cost USB camera modules. Um, as you see, there's a, the image sensor is given here on the, on the page. And especially for the low-cost USB camera and the industrial cameras, the same image sensor, different price. And uh, oh, wrong direction. Yeah, and we bought some ultra cheap MIPI cameras. Um, among others, the camera from the Raspberry Pi version two. It costs around 20 euros. And if you buy the version from AutoCam, you only pay 10 euros here in Europe. If you buy this module at AliExpress, you can get it around four to five Euro, uh, US dollars. And uh, these are all our test samples. And to make the, a fair comparison, we tried to use the same hardware, the same software, and the same lens. But it was a bit difficult, especially for the lens, there are different mounts of the cameras, C CS mount, M12. And, uh, the iPhone cam comes with its own lens. But we try to give our best to, ca to compare apples with apples. So. <laughs> and uh, our test setup, that's in our lab. It's according to the ESO norm. Uh, we use a test chart from the company Image Engineering, TE42. It has some possibilities to check the resolution, to check the dynamic range, and to check the color reproduction. Uh, we use two standard light panels that are stable in uh, color temperature and brightness. For the measurements, we use an uh, 
illuminance of 1,400 lux. Uh, we located the camera exactly in the center of the test char uh, chart. And for the image analysis, we used the software tool IQ Analyzer X. That's a standard tool, came from uh, image engineering. That's the same company like we bought the test chart. And uh, I think I've, maybe I have to hurry a little bit up. <laughs> um, what, we, what we test or investigate here for this talk, on the one hand side, we check the resolution uh, with the Siemens star. And uh, with the re resolution, we calculate the MTF diagram. That's for the sharpness. Then uh, with the black, gray, and white pattern on the target, we check the dynamic range. And in the end, we uh, check the color reproduction. The color reproduction, that's the Euclidean distance. So that means the distance between the color of the test target and the color of the image from the camera. And uh, in case of the resolution, the higher value is the better. That means more sharper. In case of the dynamic range, the higher value means a higher dynamic range. And in case of the color reproduction, the Euclidean distance, that means the lower value came more close to the test target. And uh, let's start with, uh, with the upper class, so with the iPhone and uh, the Canon. In terms of the resolution, the MTF50 value that's the value where the, the MTF curve has exactly 50%. That's approximately the same for the iPhone 15 or for a Canon camera. Uh, the dynam dynam regarding the dynam dynamic range, the iPhone is a, is a wee bit better than the Canon. And I think what's quite here quite interesting, um, normally you expect the MTF curve on the lower. That's the standard MTF curve of a lens. So in my study 20 years ago, I learned the MTF value can g never get higher than 1 or 100%. So what happens in the iPhone, so the upper graph? There we have a value nearly at 100 or 1.25. Uh, the iPhone uses an edge enhancement filter. And because of this edge enhancement filter, the software filter, the MTF value can get higher than one. And uh, yeah, the third, I see that's a good screen here on the vision. Uh, the color reproduction. Here we give you two results. In the middle, that's the test chart, always with two patterns, like given on the test chart, on like like in the image. And on the right, that's the Euclidean distance. That's exactly the value between the target and the camera from the, from the phone or from the Canon. And what you can see here is the Canon is more close to the target. And the iPhone, uh, they tuned a little bit the color more to the more shiny. Um, the red is a little bit more red. Uh, so some, our first knowledge from here is if you use a Canon, you have quite neutral images. If you use the iPhone, there are some software filters in the back, especially for the edge enhancement, as well as the colors are a little bit more, more shiny, more stronger. And uh, in the second step, we uh, made an investigation of two different kinds of cameras with the same, same image sensor, both with the Sony IMX334. Uh, the first one is from a uh, German industrial camera supplier. And the second one is from a Chinese company. The first one, we used the standard software from the supplier. And for the second one, um, there was no software available, so we used the standard Windows driver. And uh, regarding the costs, the industrial camera is around 200 euros and without the lens. And the Chinese camera came for 100 euros, including the lens. 
And so the same, same image sensor, and in terms of the resolution, the smaller M12 lens from the low-cost camera is yeah, poorer than the industrial camera. Uh, but the dynamic range, I think that's what we expected, that the resolution is better with a better lens. But the dynamic range, in case of the industrial camera, is only about 40 dB. And in case of the low-cost camera, it's around 50. So what happens here? Um, in the software and the driver, you have to choose the right value for the black level correction. And for the standard settings of the industrial camera, this value is zero. So it means yeah, there is no tuning. There is no optimization of the image. The, the locus camera, there is a black level correction all, uh, already implemented in the, in the camera itself or in the driver. And uh, regarding the color reproduction, two times the same image sensor. And uh, on the upper, we have a higher Euclidean distance than in the lower test image. That means, and that's our interpretation of these values is, uh, we think in case of the industrial camera, that's the raw data of the chip. And in case of the low-cost camera, um, they do some, some image tuning in the software or maybe in the Windows driver. We have no idea what it was the same camera chip, so there must be some, something in the software. And then on the, on the third slide, the investigation from the topic of the talk. So we investigate the iPhone from two slides before with an uh, AutoCam for 10 euros. And uh, this AutoCam, it has only a MIPI interface. And uh, we used from uh, Texas Instruments an AVAL board with an embedded Linux on it. And we used the standard embedded, embedded Linux driver who came with the board. And in terms of the resolution, I think maybe you expect it. The iPhone is much better than the low-cost uh, Raspberry Pi camera. Uh, but the dynamic range of both cameras, it's on the same level. For both cameras, we, we measured a dynamic range of 55 uh, decibel. Uh, and then uh, to the color, the color reproduction in case of a 10 euro camera is better than in case of the iPhone. Better means or better, maybe it's a wrong word. So the color reproduction comes more close to the target. The iPhone is a little bit more yeah, colorful, maybe used for the Apple or tuned for the Apple users, uh, iPhone users. And I think here it's important to mention this, uh, this tuning here we've made by ourselves. So we try, our goal was to come quite close to the, to the test target. And uh, as we investigate this result, we ask ourselves a question, OK, if, it's, if the, the dynamic range is the same or is equal to the iPhone, but the colors are more neutral, maybe we can tune the 10 euro camera on the level to the iPhone. And uh, therefore, um, we made I show you three pictures. That's the picture coming out of the camera without anything. So that's the raw data. Uh, here, that's the picture from the camera um, with a neutral tuning. So here we try to come close as possible to the colors of the test chart. And here on the right, that's the color of the iPhone. So if you take some photos with your, uh, with your mo uh, mobile phone. You will maybe more on the, on the left side. <laughs> so, uh, and there's a, a live demo at our booth. So you can come next door. And uh, to sum up in the end, I think we tested or we investigate several camera systems. 
And uh, I think the image quality of the iPhone, that's brilliant. That's great. And our key learnings of this investigation is if you use the same camera sensor, um, that means not that you have always the same image. It's uh, important that you think about which lens do I use, which driver do I use, and which software settings do I use for the camera chip. And especially in case of the, of the really low-cost camera modules, so 10 euros, including lens and, 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 the, and the FPC cable, um, in case of the resolution, uh, it's a bit poor. But in terms of uh, dynamic range, and especially in terms of the color reproduction, it is possible to tune a 10 euro camera to the level of an, of an upper class iPhone. And so let's, let's answer the question. So uh, how well can the low cost camera's image quality compete with an iPhone? So not in terms of the resolution, but in terms of dynamic range and yeah, in terms of, especially of the colors. And to give you one message with you to home, it's always important to uh, investi in investigate the entire system. It's not only the camera sensor, it's the lens, the driver, and the software. And for me, my personal learning was especially the driver and the software. Thank you very much for your attention. OK, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation and this uh, interesting comparison. Uh, of image sensors and what that is possible. So, are there any questions? There we go. Thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned the iPhone about a price level of 1,000 euros. What are the costs that Apple spends for the camera-specific hardware, like optics, imagers? Did you investigate that as well? That's a good, good question. Good question. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but I think that's the same here. If you, if you, if you took a low-cost camera module, um, you also need to investigate in the development that you came on up to the level of the iPhone. That's not out of the box. It would be very nice if you can request the cost from Apple. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but, but, but uh, uh, see it as a little homework, and next year you can share it with us. <laughs> uh, would be very interesting. Um, yeah. Okay, are there any further questions? Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I have a question regarding the uh, resolution comparison. So you said like the iPhone 15, they use like, for example, an um, edge enhancement filter, but the small MIPI cameras, for example, they didn't use any, so there were not any like specific software on it. So is that even a fair comparison actually? Or did you try, for example, um, to even further enhance the resolution with some software filters for those small low cost cameras? Um, Does that make sense, the question? We made some further investigations. They're not including in the talk. Uh, we made some special investigations with a low light, so with 10 looks, and with, we go down to one looks. And in such a case, especially for the low-cost cameras, uh, then you see what happens with the noise reduction, as well as with, uh, with the edge enhancement. And uh, the, to go back, um, and especially the, the, the processor from uh, TI, what we use for this investigation for the low-cost camera, uh, there, this processor had quite good possibilities for, for the ISP tuning. And there is an edge enhancement filter included and a noise reduction. And it's also possible here to, to uh, tune the camera for different light settings. So for example, if you have good illumination, you can uh, use a little bit more of the edge enhancement filter, and it's not necessary to, to use uh, the noise reduction. And for lower light, you can skip the edge enhancement, but use more of the noise reduction. OK, 
one last question. Hi, this is Hendrik with Missing Link Electronics. I would argue that the quality of the sensor is secondary to the pulse processing. And one of the things that we see is that if you use transformer nets for pulse processing and analytics of the imagery, the quality of the image sensor is absolutely secondary. The question is, what are your findings? Pardon, I... Okay. Okay. <laughs> the speakers are in your direction, so I have no, okay. no sound from the microphone from yours. Okay, yeah, audio is, at least we can hear you. <laughs> um, so the question is, what are your findings when using AI, more particular transformer nets, on the impact slash the quality of the imaging sensor? Uh, that's a very good question in terms of the AI. Um, we have one. We have one project. It's with a. It's, it's a weed detection system. It's used for farmers to detect weed on the field. And uh, in that case, um, you have different light conditions because di because of the weather. And here, um, the image enhancement. It was an, a quite important step because the AI. It's, it's always a question, which data do you use to train the AI? And uh, we had a set of a data set, but we do not cover all weather conditions perfectly and all directions of the, of the sun and the polarized light. And uh, at this specific project, uh, it was important to, to, in the first step, to tune or to enhance the image on the same or nearly the same quality. But it depends on the training data. OK, uh, so uh, use the chance to get in touch with Mr. Eckstein after this presentation, because now we have to go on. A big applause again. Thank you. Thank you for your nice talk. OK, ladies and gentlemen, we will now go on with the next presentation. And the next presentation comes from Mirko Benz from Bauma. Mr. Benz, the stage is yours. Okay. Oh, I already have. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, Baumer has uh, put this show under the model Break the Speed Limit. We see improving the speed um, addresses various aspects that we see at the applications our customers want to solve. And with this presentation, we want to show you how you can use GigiVision for ultra, ultra high speed applications. My name is Mirko Benz. I'm working at, as head of product manager at the Vision Competence Center at Bauma. Ah, so this already works. Yeah, just a few words about Bauma. Uh, we are international family owned business. Um, since more than 70 years, we are leader in uh, sensors that are used for various factory automation applications like encoders, position sensors, and so on. If you have any task within the factory automation industry and you're looking for a sensor, there's a really good chance that Baumer has the right product for you. In terms of vision, um, we produce uh, machine vision cameras and uh, smart vision uh, products also for more than 25 years already in Germany. And also here we cover a broad range of uh, cameras. Um, we are active worldwide, uh, roughly uh, 2,800 employees something like 500 million uh, euros in, turns in, in, in turnover every year. So we are one of the bigger companies providing mesh and vision um, technology. Um, the topic for today is really how can we address really the most advanced application with standard GigiVision technology. Of course, we have a broad range of mainstream cameras with Gigi and USB interfaces, which address almost any application that you will find in the mesh and vision industry for quality inspection. However, what we see is more and more customers would like to improve the accuracy, the quality of their inspection, but also they would like to improve the throughput of their inspection systems. And both higher resolution, higher throughput requires more and more bandwidth. For example, if you take a 
high speed or higher speed camera with 24 megapixels at 50 frames per second, then you already need a 10 gigi interface, something that is no longer mainstream. Such applications are typically found in electronics, but also semiconductor industry. It gets more and more complicated if we increase the number of cameras that are used in the system from one to many. We have several applications where we use 20 or even 30 or more cameras in a single system at a single PC. And of course, if you have such 10 gigi camera systems with such a high camera count, then the total bandwidth is really huge. And that's something that uh, is really looking for a new approach. Um, what is in use today and was introduced already 20 years ago was uh, GigiVision. At that time, 2006, when the standard uh, was rolled out, Gigi uh, was considered a very fast interface compared to the other interfaces of that time, like USB 2 or FireWire. And uh, therefore, um, the overhead uh, of the protocol processing that was pushed on the operating system and the CPU was considered doable. Um, the general approach here for uh, standard GigiVision is to use a dumped network interface card which receives the images that are packetized by the camera and just forwards these packets uh, to the operating system. However, this involves a lot of overhead, uh, like copy operation, uh, like uh, context switches, handling uh, interrupts, and so on, which really limits the ability to really achieve very high speed. And therefore, we need a new approach to really tackle this more demanding applications. From our aspect, uh, um, the real or right approach is to continue with Geeky Vision, but exchange the streaming protocol towards using RDMA. RDMA basically means that uh, the camera is now able to directly put the images into the buffer of the application. Uh, it requires a smart NIC, an RDMA-capable NIC, or network interface card that can do a lot of the protocol processing already in hardware. It's message-based, it allows to do error detection, but also helps to do error recovery by doing retransmission. And as a consequence, the operating system is now no longer in the data pass. This really frees up a lot of CPU and uh, paves the way to really high-speed applications. We did, for example, tests with 100G network cards. We get close uh, to the line rate, 99 gigabits per second, at just 3% CPU utilization. So this is really a remarkable perf performance that can be achieved with this new technology. And we want to make it possible to use this also now for standard GigiVision cameras. For high performance applications, the, uh, the dominant camera series we have is our LXT with a 10 gig -E interface. Um, with this camera, we have integrated various modern CMOS sensors from Sony, like generation two, three, and four. Um, up to 24 megapixel, but also modern uh, CMOS sensors from G-Pixel up to 65 megapixel. With this camera line, we can fully utilize 10 gig E line rate, but also have other unique features like image pre-processing, like shading correction, but also quite advanced color, co uh, color calculation, for example. We also have very um, strong um, um, uh, connectivity like uh, lens control for uh, liquid lens uh, connectivity, for example, but also a really good uh, robustness with this camera supporting IP67, but also M12 connectors for harsh environments. Um, this camera line was already introduced uh, 2018, and now we are coming up with a free of charge firmware update, uh, removing the standard way of GigiVision and replacing it by uh, streaming via RDMA. The key advantage here that customers can have is a significant reduction in terms of CPU utilization. Then a 10 gigi camera just needs 1% of CPU to uh, use the full bandwidth of 10 gigi. We keep the reliability of gigi vision, uh, so we not just do error detection, but also error recovery. This is a major aspect. So to uh, keep the reliability, our SDK supports both Windows and Linux, the major operating systems that our customers use. We made the migration to RDMA really smooth. Customers can do this within one day. So it's really straightforward uh, to migrate to RDMA and reap the benefits of it. 
Of course, we also plan to roll out this new approach of RDMA to our other cameras of this 10 gigi family. Um, what's the new highlight at this vision show is probably the most uh, advanced camera that you will find here at this vision show. It's our new QXF um, high performance multi head board level camera. This is primarily designed for very demanding OEM customers that really need the highest performance that is possible in the market. Being a board level and having this uh, remote heads, it also allows a very deep integration into the devices of our OEM customers and giving a lot of flexibility, for example, where to put the sensor heads in the system design of our cu customers. The first product uh, we release is our um, uh, 24 megapixel dual head uh, camera. Both sensors run at full speed of 100 frames per second. Um, uh, another highlight here is that we also have uh, further GIGI and NBST ports. They can be used, for example, to communicate with the system controller of a complex device, but also attach a monitoring camera if you want to see also a different aspect of your scene. All these data streams are combined within a single switch that is integrated into the FPGA so that we need just one single link here of 100G using a QSFP port to the PC. So just one single cable can combine all these data streams. As I said, this platform is very powerful. We are able to do this um, based on projects. We can attach up to six uh, Sony Gen 4 sensors at full speed. So really, a lot of performance can be achieved. So where customers want to really look at very big objects or from different angles, that's a great platform to do this. We also have very extensive uh, FPGA resources to additional image pre-processing, like 3D processing, also compression if needed. We can also adjust various aspects of these platforms, but tailored always for specific OEM applications which have really advanced demands, but also the volume to make such customization um, worthwhile. Um, of course, also, this camera supports RDMA. And this slide basically summarizes, in our opinion, what are the key benefits our customers will get by using RDMA. Of course, it's very high performance. We just not uh, have to keep at 10 gig A. We can now go to 100G and beyond. Um, it's reliable. It does not just do error detection, but also retransmission in hardware. That's a real difference. Uh, we can do retransmission with real time, uh, very low latency. It's very efficient. We have just a few percent CPU utilization at very high bandwidth. So the majority of the CPU is now available for the image processing application. Um, it's cost effective. It's using standard network cards. That's a real differentiation when we compare this to other um, approaches that are used today for high-speed imaging. These network cards are designed for other industries with really much higher volume and also available from various uh, vendors that are providing uh, network interface cards, for example. RDMA is a technology that is just new to vision. It's not new to other industries. It was designed 30, at least 30 years ago for high performance computing and uh, has proven its value for other very demanding uh, industries like storage, but also financial industry and so on. And we are now also taking advantage of this um, very advanced technology for our cameras. It keeps the scalability advantage of GigiVision, so we can rely on switches, build really huge camera networks. We have projects where uh, up to 100 cameras are attached to a single PC. So that's really a remarkable uh, feature, something that's not really doable with a frame grabber based approach. It uh, keeps the ease of use of GigiVision in various aspects. Um, a customer can get full support for entire system software, camera, network interface card from a single supplier. Yeah. It's also the case that um, various third-party software vendors will directly support RDMA. And last but not least, um, it's future-proof. So from my perspective, that's a really uh, useful interface for at least the next decade uh, where we can rely on and have much higher performance than we are able to use today. In terms of uh, system setups, um, 
we really see that we can use the same setups that our customers are used uh, with the GigiVision and 10 Gigi cameras that we have today. So we can use direct connections based on available 10G uh, dual, port camera, uh, dual port network interface cards. We can use the same approach for dual port 100G network cards, but we can also use switch-based setups. For example, we have setups where we connect 20 uh, 10G cameras via RG4, 45 uh, copper cables, and then use just two uplinks of 100G to the PC. So drastically reducing the amount of cables and um, interface cards that are needed in a PC. We can also use high performance embedded NVIDIA systems based on this uh, PCI network interface cards and even laptops are supported by Thunderbolt adapters. So basically all the use cases that our customers love about Gigi Vision are still possible now with RDMA. Um, of course we really do a lot of testing uh, with uh, this technology and we have a test bed uh, with uh, 16 cameras, 10G at full speed uh, running at an aggregated bandwidth of 160 gigabit. So that's really a lot of bandwidth when we compare this to a single Gigi camera. So 160 times Gigi cameras. Um, we can achieve full bandwidth at just a mere 4% CPU utilization. So this is really a breakthrough um, with what we can achieve with RDMA and which would not be possible with standard Gigi Vision that uh, our customers used before. Um, what's also really important, uh, we did this test over a long time, more than a couple of days, without losing any image, without losing or without any corrupt image. Of course, when doing this acquisition over a long period, there are some uh, errors that occur during the transmission from the camera to the PC. With this approach, uh, we can correct these errors in real time because we have retransmission capabilities. And as you see, the CPU is now no, no longer involved in the data processing and therefore is free for the actual application processing. However, of course, customers that really would like to see such very demanding uh, systems now need to look into memory bandwidth, but also selecting the right PCI slot, having the right bandwidth, for example, for these high-performance network cards. Um, GigiVision, um, um, 3.0 will support RDMA. Um, it's now available also already as a white paper. You can see more data at the A3 uh, web page. From our perspective, the proposal that is there for GigiVision 3 uh, over RDMA is already good enough for developing cameras, but also third-party software. We are releasing our cameras and our software. Customers can buy these pre-release products already, and we also see fast adoption by third-party software manufacturers. So this will really also drive the ecosystem of GigiVision over RDMA. We expect uh, full approval of this standard next year, and also then we will uh, have uh, fully compliant products. Um, Bauma will host this year International Vision Standards Meeting at our new innovation center in Switzerland next week. And the main idea here is to further uh, work on the standardization and we hope with the engineers that will gather there, we will also improve the finalization of the standardization. As you can see here, A3 is hosted by the um, American, or the GigiVision standard is hosted by the A3 standard and they also see GigiVision over RDMA as a leap forward for GigiVision, but also for our entire industry. So, what does uh, GigiVision basically bring you? It's the three aspects that customers that want to design high-speed systems are really looking for. High performance, reliable systems, but also low CPU utilization. But that's also something you can get today uh, with other frame-gather-based approaches. With, RG, uh, with RDMA using GigiVision, you can get much more than what's available today with a frame-gather-based approach. Since it's using off-the-shelf network interface cards that were designed for much bigger industries in much higher volume, they are very price attractive. You can buy, for example, this 50G network cards having more bandwidth than a typical high-end frame giver today at a much smaller form factor with much less power consumption. 
since it's designed really for bigger industries than we are as vision, but we can take advantage of it. If you look at the lower picture, it shows a 400G network interface card. You can buy it today. It has 10 times the bandwidth of a frame grabber that you can buy today, and it's available now. And from our perspective, this advantage in terms of technology will always be there and will continue to be improved. Gigivision is now already, uh, Ethernet is now already at 800 gigabit and more is developed. So this is really something we can rely on for the future. The main difference that we see when we look at Coexpress, for example, is the ability to have really 100% original images. With Coexpress, um, the frame grabber just does error detection, but not error recovery. That's a key aspect and the main advantage we see here. If customers want to have really 100% of the original image, there is no way around retransmission because errors over the communication will happen over time. It's just a question of when. We can keep the advantage of building really large systems. Um, it's network-based, whereas uh, frame grabbers are just point-to-point. -point. So using network switches, we can build really large systems, 100 cameras connected to a single PC that's really doable uh, with this approach. We can also have more advanced mechanisms like failover or load balancing, taking advantage of RDMA. So a si single receiving a PC can easily forward some, a part of the image via RDMA to another PC to do additional processing, for example, in, of the image or to do some monitoring. So that's really also straightforward uh, when doing uh, RDMA. And as I mentioned, that's also a key differentiation. Gigivision is one of the key standards. It has always been supported directly by the major third-party software vendors. Customers can go to the third-party software vendor and get direct support. This is not the case for a typical frame grabber, where you have to go to two different parties when you are looking for support if something does not work. And we have, Bauma have decided a couple of years ago to stop this uh, developments for, uh, for frame grabbers since we have seen more potential into the, in this uh, standard interfaces. To summarize, uh, Gigivision is clearly the dominating interface that our industry is using today. More than 50 cameras, 50% 50 of the cameras that are sold worldwide are using Gigivision today. With 10 Gig E, we could already drastically improve the performance of these cameras to a new level while keeping the underlying protocol. This is still a very good approach for small systems with 10 Gig E. However, if you are really looking for really big systems or want to maximize available CPU, or to, uh, CPU resources for application processing, then RDMA will bring Gig Evision to a fully new level. And it really keeps the price performance advantage of standard network interface cards. And really, from our perspective, there is no longer a need to use frame grabbers anymore. Yeah, just uh, last slide. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I would like to invite you all to visit our booth. It's just over there in the center of this hall. In addition to our new RDMA cameras, we will also show you some non-visible, uh, uh, inspect the visible, sorry, cameras with SWIR and UV, but also a really interesting camera, all-in-one integrated, very compact form, for, form factor for um, entry-level applications. Also a device that is pretty unique in the market. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Benz, for your nice presentation. Unfortunately, we are a little bit out of time, so everyone who has questions, please follow, follow Mr. Me. Benz to yep. the Baumer booth. And now we go on with the Thank agenda. You. Thank you again. Yep. Okay. We will now go on. Our next presenter is... Mr. Timo Eckert from the Comasense Company, and we will learn more about fast, high-resolution application with line scan cameras. So, Timo, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm I'm going to uh, divide this presentation into three parts. Uh, the first part is uh, to introduce ChromaSense and give you an overview of the group that we belong to. 
The next part is then related to the LineScan Vision platform, which is a really cool and innovative um, approach or uh, platform that we develop, um, fitting um, yeah, many industries. Um, I will talk about it later in more detail. Uh, the third part is related to uh, battery foil inspection as an application where we will then see the LineScan Vision platform in action. And uh, what was interesting for us here was to evaluate how uh, deep learning can be used um, with uh, this specific application and um, how it can be hardware accelerated to actually fit the needs of high-speed imaging. So let's start with the company overview. Chromasense is a machine vision technology provider um, that is, uh, was founded in 2004. We belong to the TKH group, and our uh, main focus is uh, related to line scan vision technology. Our business is divided in two parts. One half is uh, developing standard products uh, in the line scan uh, domain, like what you can see here on the lower right, cameras and light sources. And uh, the other half of our business is related to vision solution building. Yeah, so a customizing business. So before we move on to the next slide, I want to make sure that everyone here understands the difference between an area camera and a line scan camera. And um, uh, on the line scan side, it is important to understand that we have a sensor that ha only contains a single sensor line. And um, you uh, can acquire a two-dimensional image by actually scanning the object. So you need a movement between camera and, uh, and the object that you want to acquire an image from. So uh, here are some applications and markets that we are active in. I will not go into details, but if you have questions, feel free to approach me after this, uh, after this talk. Um, we belong to the TKH group. Uh, TKH is a, a Dutch uh, technology group um, that is working in three technology fields, in uh, smart vision systems, smart manufacturing systems, and uh, smart connectivity systems. And um, ChromaSense, belongs to the TKH vision part of that group, which is part of the smart vision system field in TKH. TKH vision is a, a global group of machine vision technology providers. And you see here um, the, uh, the, the brands that belong to this group. And um, what we have as well in this group is uh, TKH vision solutions. And TKH vision solution stands for all the activities that we do related to um, yeah, essentially uh, customizing vision solutions for our, um, our customers' needs. So uh, why am, am I spending so much time introducing this corporate structure? Um, I'm doing that because uh, there is, uh, ChromaSense is additionally operating something that we call the TKH Vision Solution Center. And the TKH Vision Solution Center is an entity that is uh, developing solutions for uh, TKH Vision and for our customers. So um, I mentioned before that half of our uh, business is related to solution building and or to customizing business. Um, and therefore, we have a long experience doing that for our customers. So let's move on to the LineScan Vision platform. So um, when we developed this platform, we were looking at some trends in the uh, uh, producing industries. And one trend is that the product life cycle of our customers' products get shorter and shorter, and there's a reduced time to market. So um, there's really a need for flexible machine vision uh, systems. We also so so see that the uh, quality standards go really up in this domain, and there is a need for faster production speeds. Um, a third trend that we see is that there is a demand for uh, reduced system engineering um, costs for this kind of systems. So modularity and flexibility are key to being able to provide um, products that are uh, fitting to our customers' needs. And um, yeah, standardization plays a large role in this. Another aspect that is important here is uh, that we see that the component suppliers more and more offer also additional tooling that allows the customers to be faster on the integration of these kind of components. So um, we developed this platform for customers that, uh, that think modular. Yeah? And uh, the core components of the uh, LineScan Vision platform are uh, a modular housing and a camera and uh, light sources, essentially. Um, and uh, you see here on the right side an example of a 
vision system that is built on this platform. And this is only one example. So the amount of cameras and the type of light sources that are being used here in a modular fashion um, can be changed. Yeah, and we will see some examples later. The flexibility comes with, um, uh, yeah, with the point that you can change those cameras. So you have different resolutions and different um, scan speeds that you can realize. And um, the whole system is very scalable for different applications. The core components are um, essentially the Alpixa Evo line scan camera family that uh, is um, yeah, uh, offering a wide range of, of uh, line scan cameras in different resolutions and different speeds, um, as well as the Corona line light family. And uh, on the Corona line light family, we have all kinds of different light sources that you find in the machine vision application. And light is uh, really he uh, key here when it comes to this modular approach. So um, the reason why light matters can be explained by looking at the uh, spectral properties, for instance, of different illuminations. So the example given here is um, a banknote uh, inspection. So um, when you look at the banknote that is shown here on the right side, um, this is acquired with different light sources, near infrared, ultra ultraviolet, and just a white light. And you can see the different features become visible in the image depending on the um, lighting scene that you choose. So um, apart from the spectral properties, you can also have a look at spatial properties. And with spatial properties, I mean the way how you illuminate your sample. So the, uh, the application example given here is PCB inspection. And um, you see here on the left side, on the, on the right side, the same PCB just illuminated differently. One time with Brightfield, which allows you to um, get an image where it's easy to inspect the substrate and contact pads. And on the right side, you see a dark field illumination that you could um, use, for instance, for inspecting print markers or, the, or find contaminations. So um, how complex is it to integrate this kind of line scan vision platform? Uh, it's essentially very easy because there is only three mounting points that you need to um, that you need to integrate into your machine. And um, then the question would be, how do you align the individual components of this uh, platform? And the way how we solve that is either by uh, delivering to our customers a pre-aligned system, or you can use uh, alignment adapters that are included here for doing this alignment yourself. We also have a, a specific software. Um, that allows you to do a kind of a life adjustment of the system, so you can really um, do the commissioning in a few minutes. So here are now some examples, but I'm not going really into details. Um, this is a line scan vision platform that is designed for battery, battery electrode foil inspection. Um, there is another example that is for uh, web print quality inspection and a third one that is for uh, PCB inspection. And really the key here is only it's the same modular approach. We just modify the type of cameras and light sources application specific. And there's little engineering time overhead for doing that. So um, if you have an application in mind, please feel free to come visit us on our booth. And uh, let's talk about configurations that fit your needs. So now the uh, other part of this presentation is related to uh, work that was done partially by two of, um, of our students um, that did their master thesis in the domain of battery foil inspection. And uh, the motivation for uh, doing this demonstrator here was that we wanted to see the line scan vision platform in action. And uh, we wanted a tool to acquire real uh, training and test data um, that can be used for evaluating an AI-based anomaly detection approach in this application. And um, for the AI-based anomaly detection, what we were really interested in is to see if the performance of these kind of systems fits the needs of line scan imaging with high resolution and high speeds. So um, we developed a, a, a test bench for doing that. So uh, the device that you see here can integrate like eight meters of continuous battery foil that is then uh, running in circles, let's say. And the application that we considered here was an anode but battery foil. But that's not really re relevant for now. And the line scan vision platform is the vehicle that you see here on the upper right side. So it contains three types of line sources and uh, line scan camera. Now, um, the AI-based anomaly detection approach that was developed was uh, simply making use of uh, standard tools. 
So uh, we chose an auto, auto encoder architecture, and uh, this is a CNN based uh, approach where, um, yeah, uh, explaining it in a nutshell, you have an input image, you have a kind of encoder stage that is uh, converting your image in a latent space representation, and then you have a decoder that, con that is sort of reconstructing the image back. Yeah? And if an uh, anomaly in your uh, image occurs, like something what we see here now on the left side, um, you go through the same pipeline, but the output image would then not contain this anomaly. So the identification of an anomaly with this autoencoder approach is being done by measuring the difference between the reconstructed and the input image. And if you have a certain threshold, you will detect it as an anomaly. So uh, that's rather simple. Now, the findings that we had here was that the uh, anomaly detection performance was really, really good. So, of course, we had to stage this because we had to define the, def uh, the defects ourselves, uh, but we had a really high accuracy. However, the speed was on the CPU and GPU implementation not really adequate for what we need in the machine environment. Um, so, it was really magnitudes of orders too slow. So there are two ways now to uh, handle this. One is you can scale up your hardware in the PC, like using better CPUs and GPUs. Um, and the other way is to uh, look into implementing the whole approach on a FPGA. And this is the path that we followed here. So we made use of, a, um, of a Xilinx uh, FPGA from the multiprocessor system on chip family. And um, this includes uh, a, a DPU that can be used for, um, uh, yeah, for uh, deploying those networks that we were talking about. And I really want to make some advertisement here for the um, Vetis AI uh, tool chain by Xilinx, which is a development platform for, um, which is designed for the AI interference on this FPGA. And um, I want to make advertisement for that because it is really simple to actually use that without needing the need of a FPGA developer. So um, we looked at this specific platform because these kind of FPGAs are used in our products, so in the Neo and Evo line scan camera, camera families. Um, and it's principle, in principle, it's, it's possible to operate it on these kind of cameras. Um, now I want to walk you through the individual steps that you have to undertake when you want to convert your application onto the FPGA. Um, uh, as I said before, it's rather easy. So the Xilinx tools uh, offer you a model inspector, which uh, is essentially um, you feed it with your uh, TensorFlow model that you generated on the CPU side. Um, and essentially, it generates you a graph-based representation of your network. Um, and Apart from that, there is sort of an info file being generated that can be used to identify bottlenecks in the implementation that you have there. And in our case, um, the picture that you see here is this output file. And what we saw here is that the last layer, uh, the activation layer of our network, contained a function that was not supported to be run on a DPU. Yeah? Um, we looked into the details of what was happening here. And essentially, uh, you can see here in blue a representation of this function. So the reason is it's a sigmoid activation function, which is continuous. And the FPGA cannot compute that in a very efficient way. So to work around this issue, all that had to be done is a linear approximation of the sigmoid function, which is a few lines of code, if you know um, how to do it, let's say. Um, this is the red dotted, dotted curve that you can see here. Um, and that, evalu that essentially removed the bottleneck here. So the next step, also a tool is doing that, is then a model quantization. Because the model that you run on the CPU or GPU is a floating point accuracy. And um, your uh, FPGA uh, uh, is better working on integer, um, uh, yeah, on integer accuracy. And in our case, we did not see really a performance drop by doing this conversion. Then the last step is essentially to compile the model and run it on your FPGA, which is very simple. So uh, we also evaluated the performance of this. And we saw that we get on the anomaly detection performance quite similar results on the FPGA as well as on the CPU and um, uh, GPU. Um, more interestingly is here to look at the runtime. And this was really the motivation why we did all that. So for simply processing on the CPU, we had a frame rate that was way too low for this application. Um, when 
doing the native uh, conversion, uh, we have this CPU plus DPU um, stage, which was already a factor of 20 faster. So it runs on the, C uh, on the FPGA, but still uses some uh, CPU computations. Um, and when doing this approximation of the sigmoid function, we could speed it up by a factor of 40 overall. And the really cool thing here is you do not need a VHDL programmer to actually do that. You just need a camera with the right platform and device AI tools, essentially. So can this now really be uh, deployed on uh, one of our cameras if you just buy it off the shelf? Uh, no, it cannot, because the FPGA that we have in there is too small. But um, it is not very difficult to design a customized camera with a larger FPGA if there is a, uh, a need for that. So um, yeah, let's wrap, wrap up. Yeah, I was introducing ChromaSense and uh, TKH Vision and our group at the beginning. Um, we can be your partner whenever it comes to um, yeah, vision components or solutions. Um, we talked about the line scan vision platform, which is really a, a modular and flexible line scanning rig. And uh, it's designed to reduce engineering time and uh, cost, essentially. And at last, we were talking about battery foil anomaly detection. And um, we saw that the line scan vision platform can be used here. And that there are actually really nice tools to um, do hardware acceleration using uh, existing platforms if you have the right FPGA in your camera. So if you want to learn more about that, you can visit us on our booth. It's here in Hi Hall 8. Uh, it's very easy to find. It's uh, this large TKH vision booth. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a nice presentation.